I'm Liz McDade, a huge Colombo fan and a small business owner living in Santa Cruz, California. And with me is my brother. I'm Paul McDade, an actor and editor working in the TV and film industry in Los Angeles. And this is Trench Coat Cigar Peugeot Wandering with Columbo. And each episode will bring you a little Hollywood history, glamour, and behind the scenes as we walk you through Columbo, one of America's greatest TV detective series. And today we're talking about season two, episode five, Requiem for a Falling Star, which aired, first aired January 21st, 1973. And our snack and drink tonight, we're having a Shirley Temple and a baked potato. So, Paul, as you know, I'm doing a dry January again this year. I've done it the last couple of years, so that means no alcohol for the month. So I'm having a Shirley Temple with um, ginger ale, a little bit of the grenadine syrup, and a little club soda, and one maraschino cherry. Mm. Yeah. It's really good. That looks good. I got Fever Tree with uh, ginger beer, and then Toshi uh, cherries, or like black cherries. And then a little bit of roses, grenadine, and then some lemon. I squeeze and some lime. Yeah, it's good. It's sweet. I didn't want to make it too sweet, but it's it's pretty darn sweet. <laughs> Same here. Nice I though. added a little um, sparkling water to mine so that it's a mm. little less sweet. And I made one yeah. for the kids, so the girls are each enjoying one. And Elliot's had one tonight too. So. Oh, nice. Yeah, and there's all. Unfortunately, all the cherries like floated to the bottom of this. Oh, the you black, can't they're see They're black them. cherries. <laughs> oh no, you can't see them. Yeah, they're kind of sort of in there. Yeah, awesome. stuck on the bottom there. Yum. So we're recording the video for this episode. So if you want to see some of this, we will be sharing the video at some point. Okay, so back to our show notes here. Oh, wait, we forgot to talk about our baked potato. Oh, yeah. Paul, what's on your... Tell me about your baked potato. I, I made the potatoes. Uh, well, I cooked the potatoes for about an hour and 20 minutes. I rubbed them with olive oil and salt and a little pepper, stabbed them, and then uh, um, added a little bit of butter, some yogurt, and then some cheese and some olives. Yeah. Some yeah. black olives. I did the same thing. I rubbed it with olive oil and salt. I did a New York Times recipe and I baked it in the oven and I put butter or vegan butter and I got some vegan sour cream for the family and I made a chimichurri sauce, which is like cilantro blended with lemon and olive oil. Yeah. And I chopped some chives and I made some little bacon bits, like vegan bacon bits with liquid smoke on um, these little like protein granules. They're called TVP. Anyhow, it turned out pretty good. Liquid smoke? So, what is that? I've heard of that with food and stuff. It's a yummy. It's like you just get it with the, um, usually it's with the barbecue sauces at the grocery store. And you just add a little bit to whatever you're cooking and it gives it a nice smoky flavor. So like if you want to make like a fake bacon flavor. Yeah. It's a really nice way to do that. Mmm. Having a bite there. No, Liz, don't. <laughs> <laughs> I did it. So we're going to put pictures of our drink and snack up on our Instagram account if you want to see what we're having and get inspired to make your own. And if you want to make your Shirley Temple stronger, I saw online that vodka is a nice um, liquor to go with a Shirley Temple, but I'm sure you could put anything inside of it. All right, so let's move on to letters from listeners. All right, we have a couple we want to share today. One is that we got an email from Michael, and he suggested, quote, in honor of Columbo and his cigar, how about calling this segment Smoke Signals? So, yeah, what do you think of that, Paul? Should we rename our yeah. listener segment? Yeah, that's great. It's a, a movie I've always wanted to see. I've never seen it, but, you know, you've always heard about Smoke Signals. So, yeah, that sounds cool. All right, so we got a new name. The other letter that we got was from Anthony, and he says, Love the whole Colombo experience. I watch it every week on TV on two different stations, Me TV and Cozy TV. I love it with the commercials like when I was a kid. I would have been about nine when Death Lends a Hand was shown originally. 
Thank you for your show. Love it. Thank you, Anthony. Oh, That's cool. Thank you, Anthony. And thank you, Michael. Mm-hmm. Thanks, Michael. And any listener who wants to write in and share a reflection on Columbo, its role in your life, or what channel you watch it on, email us at trenchcoatcigar at gmail.com. We always love hearing from you. Um, and you could also leave a comment on our Instagram account, which is Trench Coat Cigar on Instagram. All right, let's move into the summary here. So in this episode, an actress, Nora Chandler, murders her assistant named Jean Davis in order to stop Jean from sharing her dark secret with her fiance, Jerry Parks. And Nora tries to make it look like an attempted murder of a notorious journalist, blackmailer, Jerry Parks. But Columbo picks up on some small discrepancies. All right, Paul, let's get into the story here. So this episode starts with a bang, literally. So we see Nora Chandler shooting someone through a window or like a shower door kind of set and then the camera kind of pulls back we realize that she's an actress on a set paul did you recognize the living room at all in this scene no which episodes are from (laughs) all right i think it's been in at least one other episode um it looks like the living room in suitable for framing it looks like the uncle's living room there was blue carpet in this episode and yellow carpet in that one so they might have changed the carpet but the wallpaper looks really similar and the crown molding looks really similar and the chandeliers. Um, It also kind of looks like the bedroom and or the living room from Lady in Waiting, which we've also talked about. Yeah, it does look similar. Yeah, looks pretty familiar. Well, after they wrap uh, while they're filming this scene, Nora starts looking for Jean, her assistant, and another assistant pulls her aside, walks her out, shows her that someone is in town shows her a Jaguar that's parked on the curb. And I just wanted to mention that, so this was an IMDb, that her character, so Anne Baxter plays Nora Chandler, and this character is a, no- a nod to her performance as Eve Harrington in All About Eve from 1950. And she was nominated for an Oscar for Best Actress for this movie. So apparently there are several references to this film and the name Nora Chandler sounds a bit like a character from that film named Margot Channing, who was Betty Davis's character. And the nemesis in All About Eve is also a journalist and named Addison DeWitt. Yeah, they're very similar. I saw All About Eve very that the whole blackmail type thing is very sort of strong at certain points. I won't say when, but All About Eve was really good. Yeah, I won a bunch of Oscars. Yeah. But she was Oh nice. She was really good in it. Did you watch that just recently, Paul? Or is yeah. that something Yeah. Yeah, because I'd always heard about it and I'd always heard Betty Davis say, Get ready, it's gonna be a bumpy ride or something like that. Like she said it on Letterman. And that's one of her famous lines in All About oh, Eve. Oh, okay. It's because her and Baxter, the role that she plays are gonna be it's more like it, Betty Davis is jealous of her. Like she's the up and coming star. Oh, okay. who's vying for her roles, kind of, even though she is in awe of her, awe, mm-hmm. in awe of Betty Davis, who's the older, plays the older actress. Okay. Yeah, Marilyn Monroe is in it. Oh, wow. Yeah, she's got a small part. And Edith Head probably did the costumes, I'm pretty sure yeah, she did. Yeah, probably. We'll talk about her in a little. Yeah. Well, that's cool. I have not seen that movie, but I would. I probably should. I bet it, it sounds like a classic. It's really good. All right, Paul. Well, let's go to Nora's Bungalow. So Nora leaves this, this film set, heads to her home, which is on, on the studio lot. And she opens the door quietly into her home and she eavesdrops on her assistant who's talking to Jerry Parks, her fiance. And I just want to point out that Nora looks really awesome. This is her first outfit of the show. It's a, it's a tight navy blue sweater dress. It has this really cool like little line of red around the neck and around each cuff. And she's got this little sea star golden brooch on the collar. Well, anyhow, Jean, her assistant, is in Nora's home. She's smooching with Jerry Parks. 
And um, Jean looks pretty, pretty cool too. She has kind of a groovy dress on. It's like pink with all these different colored um, trees all over it. And she is played by Pippa Scott. Is that right, Paul? Did you look up her career at all? Yes. Uh, she, she and her husband, um, yeah, she did a lot of different movies. And I, she was at uh, the, um, not Uta Hagen, but uh, Uta Hagen. Well, yeah, it, with Uta Hagen, her and her husband uh, in New York, she learned there. Oh, cool. She uh, ended up starting her own television company with her husband called Lorimar. Oh. And I think that name was an amalgamation of um, a friend of hers was in the car and was sitting next to her and, or maybe it was the mountains. I can't remember. Um, but Lorimar was huge. I think they did the, the Waltons, Knott's Landing, Dallas. Um, wow. Something shows like that, if not those shows. And it was, a you know, very, she's very successful. She's a great actress, successful um, producer. So she would read all the scripts that they would get, you know, mm-hmm. and her, Dad was uh, wrote all the Ginger uh, Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire movies, all the musicals. Oh, wow. Yeah, so that's how she started understanding writing, how important writing is to film. Yeah, and then uh, later she she's still alive, mm-hmm. and she did she started a library of videos videos around the world of. Uh, people breaking the law, humanitarian laws, you know, soldiers and dictators and stuff like that. Oh, wow. In, in former Yugoslavia. Um, and so I, th- one of the universities here has the library still, but for about, for a few years there, they were helping solve cases or bring certain matters up to the UN on countries that were uh, abusing human rights. And she did a documentary called Leopold's Ghost, uh, sort of pointing out how history, what we have now, is tied to what came before in a lot of really scary ways. So I never, I didn't watch the documentary, but Don Cheadle was one of the narrators on it, and it looks really good. Very cool. So it's kind of like a Howard Zinn. Like a warning? Um, well, just sh- pointing out the truth of, of where situations are, you know, like how we end up with with factions fighting against each other, uh, bigger countries like the United States or Great Britain or Belgium or whomever giving money to maybe people who take over the place because they want to invest there. You know, so they'll cause, just like in Chile, you know, or El Salvador, you know, they'll, they'll create these really horrible situations where a lot of innocent people die and a lot of people are tortured and stuff like that. Um, and so human rights abuses um, uh, so she, she, she had a real understanding of that and researching it with different people and editors and camera people. And cause she knows the visual image is very impactful to people's understanding of what's happening, you know, and just getting a message across how important, how, how effective it is or can be. Um, so yeah, she's very, had a very interesting, strong life. Yeah. She sounds really cool. Yeah. 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 Yeah, I'd like to see some more of her work. We should, we'll put a link to um, to some of her work or her website or something. Yeah, I did see a movie and she I'm was sure. in, uh, directed by Richard Lester, called Batulia. And she's not the main actress or actor. It's um, Julie Christie. And it's sort of set in Haight-Ashbury. And Richard Lester did those Beatles movies like Help. Oh, okay. Kind of fast-paced. Um, so there's a lot of quick cutting and... Um, it's based on a book. George C. Scott plays this guy who was in a marriage. And for, for whatever reasons, he's just not happy anymore. So he makes the move to, to get divorced and he's single. It's a very interesting film. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it may be uneven story-wise, um, yeah. but it's got a kinetic feel to it. And the performances are really good. And uh, George C. Scott, as always, kind of find him very interesting to watch. And, and Pippa was really good. I wish he'd had a, a better part. She plays like a friend of George C. Scott's who she goes out with. And yeah, the few moments she's in this, she's pretty good. She's yeah. really good. Yeah, I agree. I liked watching her perform. She was very, very good. Well, I just wanted to point out a couple more things about this scene here. 
One, there's a bottle of green liquor on her bar. (laughs) I had to look it up. So I don't know if you remember, but in our very first episode, Prescription Murder, there's a bottle of green, some kind of green liquid in the bedroom. Oh, you mentioned that, yeah. Right? And I was so curious, (laughs) what is this green liquid? But in the bedroom setting, it looks like maybe it's more of a perfume. In this setting, it's supposed to be some kind of alcohol. So I had to Google, and um, there are some green liquors, like absinthe apparently is one, creme de menthe, but that might be more of like a creamy color green. There's a purple creme de violet. <laughs> oh, yeah. But I bet, yeah, that one's good, but creme de menthe, yeah, I, I, that's probably green, right? Yeah, it's green. So anyhow, that was a little, I noticed that and was very interested. <laughs> Maybe that's just dyed water, Liz. Yeah, I'm sure it's not real. <laughs> I'm sure it's not real, but it's just fun to imagine. Yeah. And in this scene, we get like a key piece of plot. So we learn that Jerry Park, so so Jean leaves, and it's just Nora talking to Jerry. And we learn that Jerry Parks has some dirt on Nora. He wants to blackmail her because she was um, basically cooking the books on the last film of hers that she produced so that she didn't lose any money, but the studio lost a bunch of money. So that's kind of an important moment here. And Jerry is, Jerry Parks is played by Mel Ferrer or Ferrer. I'm not sure how you say that. Yeah. Maybe Ferrer. Ferrer. I'm not sure either. (laughs) Yeah. Did you look him up at all, Paul? Yeah. Yeah, he's he's pretty awesome. He's great in this role. Uh, yeah, what did I see that I really... I found a really odd film. I don't, I don't know if I recommend it. He did a lot of foreign films. I wanted to see a Fassbender film he did, uh, Rainer Werner Fassbender. He, he's a German director from the like the, the 80s is when he was sort of like really hitting it. I don't think anybody's made as many films the way he he did in ter- terms of uh, high quality construction with the fair budget in the short amount of time. Because Fassbender died when he was in, I want to say his 30s or maybe his 40s. Oh, wow. And the That's output young. of films that he made was is astonishing. Yeah. Using a lot of the same performers. But anyway, Mel was in one of them and that really excited me because I'd like to see, because I like Fassbender's movies. I studied him at the University of Alabama. We had a, a class Jeremy Butler taught. Oh, um, cool. Yeah, it was the New Wave German cinema, I think. Okay. Or maybe just German cinema, but there were some New Wave filmmakers. But the one, let me try to think of one that I saw. It was this Italian production, and Ray Milan was in it. Oh, wow. There we go. Yeah. Bringing and, and it, it back. Yeah, so Ray Milan, and guess what? Ray Milan plays a detective who wears a trench coat. Oh! And he works in a greenhouse. Like what? he spends his off time in the greenhouse. I'm not kidding. <laughs> um, Somebody was a Columbo fan, whoever made yes. that. Yeah, it's an Italian production. Um, yeah, I'm looking on here to see if I can remember the name of it. The uh, Mark of... Uh, the owner of Videotech in Pasadena, he recommended, uh, he pulled a few of Mel Ferrer's films for me. Oh, nice. Man, and uh, that was everything. one of them. It was a like, a, it, I didn't know what was going to happen at the end. And so the way they edited it was very interesting and okay. good in some ways. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a kind of a one of these mixed uh, co-productions of different countries. And Mel Ferrer, he's good, but he he's not in it as much as Ray Milland. He was in uh, a movie called Lily. Was it Lily? And that was really sweet. That's really cute. Mel? Yeah, he plays a uh, puppeteer who is injured, and he's very, he's kind of an alcoholic, and he uh, is very angry at the world because he used to be a great ballet dancer, and, and then he hurt his leg. Yeah, I think it's called Lily. And the actress who plays Lily was is wonderful to watch. She was She was that character okay she plays this uh there's a, there's some things that you wouldn't do now in terms of their ages uh making that film he was in a um toby hooper movie called eaten alive and uh, he played the father he was good in that and he taught toby hooper he's the guy who directed texas chainsaw massacre oh okay um yeah and so that was toby hooper's first studio film after texas and he didn't realize 
that actors would uh, do the same thing for continuity in each in each take. And he realized he's, he noticed that from Mel, and he was kind of blown away that kind of skill. He hadn't seen yeah. that before. Oh, cool. So that's interesting. And what else did Mel? Oh, Mel, you know, he was married to Audrey Hepburn. Oh. Yeah. And wow. they were married for a while. And um, I sent you a picture of him and Edith Head, the three of them together. But he produced a great film uh, with Audrey Hepburn, Alan Arkin, Richard, uh, Richard Crenna called Wait Until Dark. And it's based on a play. The guy who wrote it also wrote Dial M for Murder. Okay, this yeah. really good playwright. So it's very similar in terms of really good story and really you could do it on stage, but the movie was really good too. And okay. he produced that. I don't think he, he directed some stuff, but that is an excellent film. Like a lot of people have remarked about that film over the years. What's the name of that one again? That one's called Wait Until Dark. Okay. We'll put that one in our show notes too. Yeah. So I was trying to think of anything else with Mel Fair that was, uh, I really liked. That was probably, those were probably the more interesting ones. I did see a couple of things though. Well, we can talk more about his performance in this episode as we go. Yeah. He was also really fun to watch. All right, Paul. Well, it's time for an outfit change. Uh Uh-oh. So Jean uh, returns to Nora's bungalow after running an errand for Nora. And now Nora is in her uh, second outfit of the show. It's a white turtleneck sweater with a long amber suede vest. Did you like that? I thought she looked awesome. This is the kind of thing that is still cool you would wear that right in santa cruz (laughs) yeah definitely walking the dogs that's how i I, keep you warm though that's true that vest is like that seems like it could be very warm yeah yeah (laughs) yeah but she looks great and um and now that she's wearing her suede power vest uh these two have a bit of a confrontation over jerry and you know nora doesn't trust jerry and nora is angry um, about Jean and Jerry. And um, she gives Nora a long list of errands to run. Yeah. That'll interfere. So Nora knows that she's trying to go out with Jerry tonight, but she, she pretends she doesn't know. And she's like, gives her a long list of errands and says, oh, I'm so sorry. I know you were going to go out with Dorothy tonight. Didn't you do that to some of your friends in college, Liz? <laughs> when you were like mad at them? Yeah. And they promised they'd help you out? Yes, yes. <laughs> Did I just I call you out there? <laughs> give my friends a long list of errands. <laughs> You're like, I have to study for exams, so I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> you said you would do this, Nora. <laughs> uh, no, I don't get to boss anyone around these days. Everyone could use their own personal assistant, <laughs> though, I got to say. That would be pretty nice. Yeah. And... I don't know if you recognize the sofa, but I am pretty sure this is the same sofa that actually, no, you, you wouldn't recognize it because it's, it hasn't come up in, in, in our episodes yet, but I'm pretty sure we're going to see this sofa again in future Columbo's. Oh, thanks. You just ruined it. Liz. <laughs> I just ruined them for you. Oh, <laughs> shoot. Oh, production designer is the same thing or the, yeah. The girls and I were looking back and forth at the sofa trying to figure out, is it the same one? I think this sofa is reused in Candidate for Crime, which is one of my top two all-time favorites. Oh, and wow. Deadly State of Mind. I look forward to those. Yes. You know, recognize this sofa. Burn that image into your brain, Paul. <laughs> I, I already have. Okay, good, good. Um, but yeah, I thought Jean, Jean does a good job in this scene. Um, or I should say, uh, Pippa Scott. She's, we get to see a little bit more of her here. Yeah. Yeah. She was, I was believing everything she said. Yeah. She just seemed like a real sweetheart. All right, Paul, well, let's take a ride. All right. We're going to go down to the Seekers bookshop. Now, according to the Columbo file map, this Seekers bookshop scene was filmed at Sunset Plaza on Sunset Boulevard. Now, obviously, the exterior looks pretty different, but I could see how this it could be the same general area. Like the the facade is different, but the street and the parking could be. You're Sunset talking about Plaza. the bookstore. Yeah. And wh- what's it? Where is it supposed to be? Sunset Plaza on Sunset Boulevard. Okay. 
That's what it says on the Columbo file map. And and if you look at that, if you look at that on Google Maps, you could kind of imagine how it might be true. I don't know. Sunset Plaza on Sunset Boulevard. Mm-hmm. It reminded me of the Bodhi Tree, which was a very well known New Age store in. Uh, I'm not sure where that was. Somewhere in LA. Uh, well, is let me see Sunset Plaza. Yeah, I don't know. I don't think it was there. Um, I see Bodhi Tree. Buddy Tree has been closed for a while. Yeah, no, the the that's like a back entrance, and yeah, it would be a back entrance. Yeah, and there is like a street that kind of pulls around the side of Sunset Plaza. Okay. Like there's Sunset Boulevard, but then you can kind of pull around the side to park on the side street. I don't know. It's possible. Yeah, I was saying it was on Melrose. That's where that was. Yeah, by the Pacifica Design Center, Pacific Design Center. Bodhi Tree was. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, it's been closed. I filmed a couple of uh, writers uh, who came to to pitch their book and give it, you know, give a talk. Oh, cool! Yeah, yeah, it's a cool bookstore. If you if you're interested in, um, uh, they you know they have different categories. They'll have stuff by people who are in Indian tribes or section on channeling tarot. Oh, you know, okay. That. that sort of, you know, spiritual kind of stuff. Yeah. So yeah, the different, yeah. Spiritual metaphysical, metaphysical. Yeah. Different mm-hmm. cultures. Of, very you know, LA, of very LA. <laughs> <Woo-woo>. <laughs> That's right. Wellness. That's right. I love it. Very, no, it's just California, Liz. It's everybody in California. Yeah. I guess we have a little bit of that here, but just kidding. I'm more more, LA. Yeah, it seems like Santa Cruz. See, you have a bookstore right by that. Sushi place going towards the beach. Mm-mm. What yes, bookstore? you do. It's a metaphysical bookstore. Oh, we used to have closed. Oh, Liz, why? I know. It was such a bummer. We had this cute little tarot yeah, I just card. To go in there. Yeah, it was like tarot cards, crystals. I don't know. Weird little things. It, it closed. It moved to a different location, probably a more affordable location. Mm, cool. I got these. Uh, what order are, are those tarot cards? It's African tarot cards, yeah. Oh, cool. Is that a Christmas gift? It was a Christmas gift, yeah. Oh, I might have to do a reading. Yeah. You have to read my cards, Paul. Sorry if my nails look scary because uh, I told you I, I, oh, I yeah. auditioned for something, so I'm looking a little scarier than usual. Mm-hmm. I'm just trying mm-hmm. to do like a Robert De Niro and Angel Heart. Okay. Where he plays the devil. <laughs> he has these really long nails. I'm not playing the devil, but I play a really scary person. So. Okay. <laughs> I know you didn't notice, but <laughs> no, I didn't notice <laughs> somebody else. <laughs> but when you point out, when you point it out, they do look long. So that's good. You explained that. Yeah. Okay. Well, okay. We don't know exactly where that was, but it might be there at uh, sunset Plaza or it could be uh, on Melrose perhaps. No, 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 that's definitely not. Okay. Yeah. It's not that okay. place. I just, re- it just reminded yeah. me of that, you know? Well, anyhow, this is sort of a short moment, but Jean goes into the bookstore to talk to Jerry and we see that Nora is up to no good. She's followed Jean there. And then Nora heads up to Jerry's house and and waits for Jerry's car to arrive. And she blows up the car and the driver. What did you think of that car, that gr- green car she was driving? Uh, yeah, that was a cool little car. Wasn't that cool? Yeah. yeah. I should have looked it up. Usually I look up the cars. I looked up Jerry's car's car, but I didn't look up her car or the studio car, I should say. Yeah, she she used to have names for everything in real life and backstory. Oh, really? So like all her cars had names. Uh-huh. Yeah, in her book Intermission, which is like a uh, just a um, section of her life to her second husband. Uh, she was married to John Hodiak, who was an actor who died very young, unfortunately, forty one years old. They did a film together called Homecoming with Clark Gable and Lana Turner. A very good film, really good film. Anyway, in her book, her second marriage is to this, uh, I forget his name, but they moved to Australia together. And um, in the book, she talks about always naming her cars. Um, but actually, uh, St. John, my wife, she she has names for all of our cars. Do You, you guys don't do that, do you? <laughs> <laughs> Not yet, Liz. Even Vesta calls, uh, my daughter Vesta, she calls our little e-golf mm-hmm. small fry. <laughs> She's like, we go to small fry? <laughs> oh, I like it. Like, yeah, let's take small fry. Well, we just have the one car, so there's not really much to name. Not yet. Yeah. Just give it a minute. I know. Actually, no, I take that back. So, you know, we have a Tesla that we, like, co-own. 
so we have it. You co you co own it with someone else? Yeah, with Elliot's parents. So okay. We, we split time with the Tesla, so half every couple months we swap. Oh, cool. And the Tesla does let you name it. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, there's like uh, you know, there's like a screen and you can like Kit from Knight Rider? Yes, but the girls got in there first and they named it. So guess what they named the Tesla? Um, beautiful. No. <laughs> Roger. <laughs> so the Tesla has this feature where you can uh, set fart sounds. <laughs> okay? So that when you're using awesome. the blinker, when you're using the blinker, instead of like a click <laughs> click click yeah. it's like disgusting fart sounds oh, and there's nice. like seven awesome. different choices <laughs> of sounds you can also just touch a button and make a fart sound come from someone's seat so you <laughs> really? can make it sound there's like speakers the, in, the, <laughs> in, the, in the seats <laughs> well they're not in the seats they're like alongside the seats right oh, okay right yeah yeah so anyhow the girls got into the car and they named it first they named it the fart mobile <laughs> I like that. But that is not the family name. We don't oh, call on, it that. Liz. They just named it that and it shows up like that on our phone and Oh, Liz. When you when you get first get in the car. <laughs> uh, you can make the um you can make a fart sound um on the somehow on the outside of the car so that when you're driving past a pedestrian, you can make the car fart at the pedestrian. <laughs> <laughs> that, what a great thing to have. <laughs> I don't know how the kids discovered this feature. There's already enough have, road rage. You don't I need know. A, we have to tell them, <laughs> don't do that. No one wants to be farted at. Uh, okay. Anyhow, maybe we'll cut some of that out. <laughs> Edit that out. No, no, um, that's good. Okay. Uh, All well, right. Unless you want to. Well, I was going <laughs> to say one, one thing I noticed, actually, uh, St. John was watching Knight Rider, uh -huh. <laughs> the pilot, and um, Richard Basehart creates Knight Rider. Oh, really? And guess where he lives in the episode? Pasadena. Greystone. Oh, that's crazy. Yeah, so so his, he has these exterior shots where he's outside of Greystone looking over. And then I think he's he provided the voice for, for the first Knight Rider. I read that. Oh my but, gosh. but I saw that and I was like, wait a minute. He's been there before. Richard Basehart. Yeah. I wonder what he thought. Like, oh, here, I'm here world. again. <laughs> this whole Hollywood industry, it's kind of a small world. Yeah, for sure. All right, Paul. Well, are you hungry? Are you ready for some dinner? Yeah, I could have another potato. Okay, let's go eat. We're going to go to a restaurant. So in the next scene, it's a little bit, there's a little bit of humor. You mentioned the explosion? Yeah, yeah. I oh, said, okay, sorry. I said she blew up the, the car and the driver. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I remember. Yes. Um. Okay, so now we're at a restaurant with Nora and the head of the studio, Mr. Fallon, and then the um, head of the company who purchased the studio, and then Mr. Fallon has some kind of a date with him. And anyhow, so there's, they're sitting at the table, and the young woman who's with Mr. Fallon's like, can I change my order? Can I get a lobster instead? And the, and the other people laugh at her. I guess she's being unrealistic. But... The restaurant scene is set in a restaurant with white brick walls and red leather booths. And there's like some sort of stained glass window decor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So Different I, colors. I am pretty sure I figured out this restaurant and I'm so excited. I think mm. this is filmed at La Dolce Vita, which oh. is an old school Italian restaurant in Beverly Hills. Oh, cool. Yeah, it's closed right now, um, but it has red leather booths um, and brick walls. The white paint is not on the brick walls. Now they're red brick walls. But when oh, the booths aren't red, now they're more of a burgundy color. But I'm pretty sure this is where it was filmed, even though it doesn't say on IMDb or anywhere where it was filmed. But I think that's where it was filmed. And just a quick history about this restaurant. It was founded in 1966 by two uh, former waiters. And it act one of the original investors was Frank Sinatra and um, George Raft, who was a big Hollywood... I've heard of him. I don't know. Exactly. Yeah. And Frank Sinatra used to like to uh, go to La Dolce Vita frequently. Oh, so, wow. yeah. Um, 
So anyhow, this scene also inspired our drink and our snack. So I don't know if you noticed, but they all have glasses with cherries in them. I didn't notice. Yes. And Mr. Simmons, the executive, is having a baked potato. Oh, okay. Everyone else is eating some kind of simple iceberg lettuce salad. So not as exciting. Did you recognize Dr. Frank Simmons who played him? He looked familiar, but I didn't, um, I didn't know why he looked familiar. I want to say he'd be in another Columbo. He was in, he, Dad, he was in Murder, She Wrote. Oh, um, Dad okay. told me about him um, because I went to see Invasion of the Body Snatchers, the second one, the Philip Kaufman, uh, Donald Sutherland, the whole great cast in that one. He opened it. Kevin McCarthy, he hits, he's like, they're coming, they're coming, because he was in the first one, mm-hmm. the black and white one. Mm-hmm. And um, it's funny, because they shot the first one, a lot of it, in Sierra Madre, where my oh. kids uh, have gone to school. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And this, it's like this little idyllic, and it's like, this, it looks the same. <laughs> like, wow. it looks the same as it did in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, that That's little crazy. location where he works as a doctor. So, but yeah, Kevin McCarthy was in both of the first two invasion. There's a third one that Abel Ferrer directed, but yeah, he's given the credit of running man, but I always remember that. And then he was in, um, I want to say he was in the Twilight Zone movie. Oh, okay. I don't, I can't remember if he is for sure. I'm looking, he was in inner space. I think I recognize him from murder. She wrote. Oh, okay. Cause I don't, I haven't seen the body snatchers. That's a super scary movie. Mom th- know, seems to think I got asthma. Yeah, it, it gave you asthma. Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I know I had asthma when we moved to Munich, but I, I'm not sure if it was from that movie. I mean, maybe it was. Yeah, <laughs> uh, I don't think so. Paul. It's super scary. Oh, he was in Twilight Zone. Yeah. Okay. The movie. Yeah, I think he was in the Joe Dante one, and he was in Piranha with Bradford Dillman. Oh my gosh! So so many connections. Yeah, Bradford Dillman. <laughs> Well, um, so in this restaurant scene, this is when Nora, um, her dinner is interrupted by the waiter who says there's someone who needs to talk to you. And this is when Nora gets the news that um, a, there's been an accident at Jerry's home, but it's Jean that's dead, not Jerry. And she faints in this moment. This is her, I'm going to lose track of the numbers here. I think this is her third outfit. Um of the um, of the show, so now she's in this up scene. She's wearing a really pretty uh, silky um, dress with like different abstract flowers on it. Um, it's very artsy and feminine. She looks great. So, would you say that uh, Grady Hunt he kind of stepped up his game in this one? He absolutely stepped up his game in this episode. I mean, mostly on her, but then um, there's a later scene where Mr. Fallon looks pretty dapper. And even Mr. Simmons has like kind of a cool sport coat at some point. And, you know, Columbo, well, we'll get to this scene, but Columbo gets a new tie. Mm-hmm. I mean, mm-hmm. this is bananas. So, yeah, I think Grady Hunt really went the extra mile for this one. Yeah, we'll screenshot that. I already screenshot that one. Oh, good. Because <laughs> it's so good, weird good, to good. see him in that tie. It's very and weird. And it stands out. Like you said before, how he chose his costume with the colors Mm-hmm. It's such a, it's just kind of like really thinking about the character you're creating. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Okay, well, it's time to go back to the studio, Paul. And Columbo is finally on the scene. Well, can I, can I say something real quick? When he, of course, you know, when he comes through the gate? Yeah. I love that conversation and scene with him with the, the gate guard, Jack Griffin. Yes. Who played lots of truckers. And that guy's a really good actor. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but if you look in Peter Fox car after he says, you need to have a uh, sticker and he's like, I got oh, my yeah. sticker in the window. And he's like, what sticker? And the sticker's gone. The sticker's gone. And he's like, somebody took my sticker. And, and he said, I had the sticker this morning. If you look below his arm, you'll see a copy of probably that day's script yeah. of Columbo. You can see on the seat, the, the indention of how scripts are made it looks mm-hmm. just like a script. So it's probably the oh script. <laughs> it's right. pretty funny. You're going to have to screenshot that too, Paul. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'll, yeah. I'll do, I'll do that. That's yeah. Awesome. So that, that I was surprised to see that, but I, I think when you're on a television screen back, back in the day, 
you know, things happen so quickly, but I, I'm so close to this computer here. This is where I usually watch it. Yeah. That it was easy to, to tell that. And I loved th- th- that actor, Archie Bacon. Is that his name? I thought you said Jack Griffin. No, Jack Griffin. I, oh, yeah. Who's Archie Bacon? I don't know. Is it one of the producers or Arch- he's the art director. Oh, Arch Bacon. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. I thought, um, that scene was super funny. The guy's like, you're late. The, oh, the yeah. demolition oh, yeah. derby's That's... starting. <laughs> it's so good. That's hilarious. That's right. I forgot about that. Sorry, I just took a bite <laughs> of my potato skin. It's all over your lips, Liz. I know. Just mm. So the little Peugeot was mistaken for like a, a stunt, a demolition car, a car that's supposed to get crushed. But they let him in eventually, and he drives past a couple interesting like studio you know, scenery, there's a person kind of dressed as a Native American riding a bicycle. And there's um, a merry-go-round being towed on the back of a truck. Um, and he finally pulls up to Nora Chandler's bungalow. And he cleans himself up a bit, which mm-hmm. is kind of cool. We don't really see him do this very often, but he clearly wants to impress Nora Chandler. He brushes off his pants. He wipes his shoes on the back of his pant legs. <laughs> And then he starts cleaning underneath his fingernails. Mm-hmm. And he's, you know, he, there's a couple of people between him and Nora. So there's the head of the studio, Mr. Fallon, who tries to shoo him away. And then um, next is uh, the head of the, um, the company that purchased the studio, whose name, Mr. Simmons, right? Mm-hmm. Next, it's Mr. Simmons who gives him a talking to, says, you know, she's, she had to be hospitalized, you know. Yeah, Her, you know, <laughs> don't linger, whatever. <laughs> so she's got her little, her little entourage looking out for her. And I just wanted to point out that um, the exterior scene um, where Columbo is parking his car and walking to the house is a, is different than where they filmed the actual uh, front door and his entrance. So they went from the actual the outside, real outside, to a studio. For the, for the door and actually going inside, obviously. They matched it pretty good. They did. I thought they did a really good They're job. Really good. I, yeah. I wouldn't have noticed that, but I, I think that was on IMDb listed as like a little goof or piece of trivia, I forget. So I just happened to notice that. Um, so Nora is in her bungalow. She is in her fourth outfit. Um, it's an awesome white lace or crocheted kind of suit with a big blue brooch and some big earrings. Um, and Columbo pulls sort of this classic Columbo move of really like, testing her patience and, you know, being s- m- seriously sidetracked from why he's there. Tells her, I've been in love with you all my life. Um, and I he thought, seems you- sincere, though. I think he is sincere, but I think he also, also is, yeah. is being a detective. That was that. Yeah. That's like that. That's uh, reminds me of the Ben Stiller and Janine Garofalo with Casey Kasem. Mm-hmm. Did you ever see that? No. Uh, yeah. It's uh Ben Stiller plays this guy who wants Casey Kasem to come meet his wife and Casey Kasem, the, the radio show host. Yeah. I remember yeah. who that is. Mm-hmm. Um, he wants him to go meet his wife and do the do. He actually wants him to be a waiter <laughs> for his wife. Oh. Like he sees him in the restaurant. He's like, you yeah, Casey Kasem. I love you. I love your work. He's like, no, seriously, come on, go talk to my wife. He's like, I'm eating. I can't, I don't want to get no. up. He's like, no, 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 seriously. Come on, get up. <laughs> it's really funny. I think I do remember that. Do you remember that? Yeah. Yes. And, and it's also like the Jim Gaffigan where Jim Gaffigan plays himself getting his newspaper and the jogger sees him says, Hey, you're the, you're the hot pocket guy. He's like, oh yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. He's like, can can you say you're gonna make a hot pocket? I'm gonna be jogging. Can you say that to me while I'm jogging away. <laughs> <laughs> but like calling his brother-in-law Ralph, that's that's kind yeah. of the same thing. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, it's not. Uh, it's over the top, right? It's over the top. Can you ask him how tall he is? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's so gracious, though. She's so mm-hmm. gracious. And, um, you know, her home is, you know, obviously it's a studio set, but it's, it's set for like, it's a really glamorous sort of setting that she lives in chandelier, long golden curtains, lots of white 
kind of a marble look to it. Pictures of herself against the wall. Yeah. Yes, four or five pictures of herself on the wall, which I love. Maybe more stars actually did that then, probably, huh? Yeah. Now, probably, probably. not so much, but maybe it may, that would be, you know, like people did that then. Yeah, who knows? It seems weird to me, but... Um, but I had to look up, like, okay, there's this house on a studio. Is this, does this actually happen? And, and here's what I learned. So here, here's what I was trying to figure out. Can you live in a house on a studio? And the answer is yes, Shirley Temple, mm-hmm. uh, which also inspired our, this is another reason we we're having Shirley Temples. Shirley Temple did. She lived in a house on um, a studio. So here's a little history for you. 20th Century Fox built Shirley Temple a house on their studio in 1935 because she was, at the time, the biggest star that the studio had. She was, like, bankrolling the whole studio with her films. Wow. So they built her a four-bedroom bungalow on the lot. It had a garden, a picket fence, a tree with a swing, and a rabbit pen. And then the living room wall was painted with a mural depicting her as a fairy tale princess wearing a golden star on her head. Mm. So, and, you know, in um, this um, episode of Columbo, she says that she had this home, got this home when she was a child actress. So it's kind of. You know, I, I don't know if Shirley Temple was the only child actress to have this or if this was fairly common um, for really big child stars, but it was definitely not unheard of. Mm-hmm. And Universal Studios, um, which is mostly on an area of land known as Universal City, it's about 400 acres. So it's very possible that there were a few bungalows on the lot somewhere. And it's one of the oldest film studios in Hollywood that's still in use today. Oh, wow. Yeah, I wondered that, too. I did. You, that is really Edith Head's uh, salon. Oh, OK. It was at Universal Studios, I guess. Yep. And she all the way to the end, she would still wave at tours that people would come by. Oh, that's so she cool. She would wave to them. Yeah. Yeah. She's very interesting. Awesome creator. Yeah. All right, Paul, it's time to go to police headquarters. And it's time to change clothes again. Oh, yeah. I like this outfit. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> <hey. laughs> yeah. Yes. So Columbo drives Nora from her bungalow to police headquarters. Nora can't open the door to get out of his car, which is <laughs> hilarious. She's like struggling. And yeah, she's got a new outfit on. It's a white sweater and matching skirt and cardigan and there's the letter a that runs across it um it's really it's really looks cool i mean it's very 70s but it looks cool and i was trying to figure out like what designer was putting the letter a on their clothes because in a future episode there is another dress with the letter a all over it yes it's a red dress and it's in candidate for crime again that episode i really like and, um, yeah, I don't know who I did a little Googling, but I don't know what designer was doing that. I mean, the only designer I know of who has an A is Anne Klein. She was designing at that time or she might've had someone designing for her. So it could have been an Anne, A for Anne. I don't know. Well, it was, if anybody knows, any listener knows, let us know. Well, I mean, Grady, <laughs> you think Grady Hunt would have ordered it from somebody, huh? Yeah. I mean, I'll, I wonder if he made the costumes too. That's true. He could have definitely have made some of the costumes, but I don't know if he could have made the sweater. That's something that you would have had to like knit, you know, yeah. have knitted. I don't know. Maybe. Or design, you know, hire someone yeah. to, to make it. You design it. That's true. That's true. I mean, he could have had somebody knitting for him. That would be a lot of time and work though. I don't know. Well, um, so this is, you know, this is kind of a short scene. Columbo's explaining to her the, the issue they're having about the car that someone let the tire, the air out of the tire. They have this, I love this little moment they have at the end of this scene where they're sitting in the car together and Columbo looks at her and says, you know, the only reason that Gene is dead is because somebody made a terrible mistake that night. And Nora just sort of looks away and, 
look straight ahead. It's a good little moment of drama there between the two of them. Yeah, when, when he walks her to the car, back to the car, he's also really looking at her like his usual when someone else can't see him and he's trying to get a read. He's doing his, his like seeing her whole behavior because that was the, you know, the point of showing her the car just to see what kind of reaction she would give. So she gives the reaction a friend would give, but is it, is it truthful? Right. Is it genuine or is she acting? Cause she's clearly a very good actor. Yeah. And he does um, that look with her, like you said, just staring at her mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and she just turns. <laughs> yeah. I felt like that was a little bit of a tell, you mm-hmm. know, like she couldn't keep looking at him. She had to look away in that moment. Mm-hmm. And I just wanted to mention the car briefly. So Jerry's car is a Jaguar XKE or an E series if you're not in the U.S. And I, I just looked up what, what are these cars worth today. So this is a pretty nice Jaguar. And one of these, so the last several years they've been, there's been some sales of these vintage XKE Jaguars. And they, one of them sold for $467,000. One of them sold for $528,000. One of them sold for seven point three million mm. at auction over the past several years. So those are probably like, I don't know if Jerry's Jaguar was that nice, but among in that series there were some very like rare, like twelve made only. Um, oh, okay. Jaguars that have sold for a ton. So, and this we've seen Jaguars in um, three other episodes so far, Paul. Yeah. Do you remember them? Uh, one was the lady in waiting, right? No, huh? she had a Ferrari. Oh, Ferrari. <laughs> Come on, man. Yeah, you know, I, cars are very interesting, but yeah, F one eighty. You know, like I didn't know what that was for years. You know, the truck. The truck. Yeah. You mean the F one fifty? See, there you go. <laughs> oh. Oh my goodness, Paul. So that that's point in case. Uh huh. There uh-huh. you go. You you were wondering why, and there you have I'm it. Like what? What is he talking <laughs> about? F one eighty. What? I think that's what I said no, a long time ago. I think it's the same thing. Oh yeah, really? And, and Saint John was like, "What do you do? You mean one <laughs> fifty? <laughs> oh, Paul. We got to send you to car education school. You should crash course. Well, anyhow, it was um, a Tude in Black, Greenhouse Jungle, and Dagger of the Mind. Oh, okay. Yeah. And in Green, Greenhouse Jungle, they use the same music that they use in this one. Yes, that's right. <laughs> that Jaguar was yellow, and it was not as fancy as Jerry Parks's Jaguar. Um, and then the same in Dagger of the Mind, it was like a cute little... Um, am I getting confused? I can't mm, remember, but there's a Jaguar Liz, in that one. Look at you. No, but I look back. There's definitely a Jaguar. I just don't remember which car was the Jaguar. Okay. All right, Paul, we better pay Jerry a visit now. Visit the scene of the crime because Columbo's back up there with the crew. Jerry's there. Columbo's trying to explain to him what he thinks is going on, and Jerry's trying to play dumb, like, oh, I don't know why anyone would want to hurt me. <laughs> but we get a quick view of the city from Jerry's driveway. It's really nice. And the house is actually on um it's on IMDB. It's 8711 St. Ives Drive which is in, um, I think this is considered the Hollywood Hills neighborhood. It's the hilly streets right above Sunset Strip. And you can't see the same house. Now there's a gate, but you can tell, like, if you look on Google Maps, you can see the same driveway. You can get a feel for like, okay, yeah, that's the same driveway where they filmed Columbo. What's the address? 8711 St. Ives Drive. And this is a pretty fancy house. It's a four bedroom, three bed, three um, bath, estimated at six point three million dollars right now. Not for sale. 
So that was where they did the exterior. And then obviously the interiors were back on the studio. So Columbo asks Jerry if he could use his phone. Jerry takes him into his office. And Columbo notices lots of photos of celebrities on the wall. There's Clark Gable, Gene Harlow. This is from IMDb, by the way. I didn't recognize all these faces. Lionel Barrymore, Rudolph Valentino, Sammy Davis Jr., Carol Lombard, Leo Carrillo, Gary Cooper, W.C. Fields, Carmen Miranda, and Marilyn Monroe. And then Nora calls Jerry's while Columbo is there in the office. And we get a quick glimpse at her, a quick glimpse at her in her calling from her bungalow. She's changed her clothes again, Paul. <laughs> of course. <laughs> She's in this, her sixth outfit, which is an awesome blue dress with big poofy sleeves and some groovy flowers, white and pink and dark blue flowers. So Columbo's trying to get a feel for Jerry. Jerry's not being helpful at all. And when Nora calls, Jerry pretends it's a... It's a wrong number. Mm -hmm. And Columbo, of course, notices that it was a woman who called. He is very observant. You can't get a single thing past Columbo. Yeah. And he has to comment on it, too. Yeah. You know, that's the thing with, uh, I forget what he says. (laughs) Yeah, he says, if a guy calls, you just say, wrong number, sorry, and you hang up. But if a woman calls, you're going to be more polite. You're going to say more words. Well, I think it's time for a walk in the park, unless there's anything else you want to say about Jerry's house or this moment between the two of them. No. Mm -mm. Okay. So we're going to go now to the park where Nora is pulling up. Actually, it's not really a park, but Nora is pulling up outside of the sportsman's lodge. She's changed her clothes again. (laughs) She's in her seventh outfit. Um, which is awesome. The main thing about this outfit that's amazing is her sunglasses. I don't know if you noticed, but they're like in the shape of a stop sign, like these little octagons. They're gold. They're gold rimmed and they're um, octagonal. They're just amazing. I think they would be very chic still today. Yeah. Yeah, I was trying to get to that spot on the... IMDb TV, but it's still on a commercial. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Nora is at the Sportsman Lo- Sportsman's Lodge to meet Jerry Parks to talk about um, Gene's death. And they did actually film these um, exteriors at the Sportsman's Lodge. And this was a real place. I don't know if you heard about this, Paul. But uh, it was torn down in 2019. But this um, building... And exteriors, actually the interiors, were used for a lot of other TV and film. So the office filmed part of the Niagara Falls episodes where Pam and Jim get married. They used the interior of the Sportsman's Lodge. Did you recognize it? No, I didn't because it was, they didn't go inside in this episode. They're only on the outside, yeah. Parks and Rec, the TV show, also used the interior and then there's been a bunch of other TV, uh, TV shows and movies that have used this location. And quick, quick history about it. So in the, starting in the 1880s, this property was used as a trout fishing destination. And you can see in the scene that there's still a lot of, um, there's still some ponds. And they have a sign about like where to rent fishing poles. So I guess it was still a fishing destination, at least somewhat. And then... As the film industry got more popular and in, in, in that area started to grow, then the destination became more of like a Hollywood destination. And people like Humphrey Bogart, Audrey Hepburn, Clark Gable are some of the actors who spent time at the Sportsman's Lodge. Well, Mer- Mel Ferrer would have been there then if, if it was the time that he was married to, mm-hmm. to Audrey, yeah, perhaps. definitely. So this scene... Um, Nora and Jerry are talking about what's, you know, the way the case is developing. And Jerry says, oh, I really got you now, Nora. You're trying to kill me. And it's so obvious. But then Nora pulls out um, some letters that Jerry had written to Jean. And she kind of turns the tables on Jerry and says, actually, you had a motive for killing Jean. Maybe, you know, 
you were borrowing money from her and maybe she started to get suspicious. So she kind of, things get kind of, you know, jumbled about in this scene between the two of them. You don't really know what's, what's what. I mean, we do as a viewer, but yeah. And it's funny because he's like, what, what are you insane? It's, it's funny. Cause he was evil enough to like blackmail her. Right. And then, yeah. and then he's like, well, are you insane? You're going to, you know, it's like, yeah, you're going <laughs> to, you're going to fight. She's going to fight back. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But, but she's taking it even further in a way. Mm-hmm. And that's when yeah. you kind of see the difference between those two, I guess is what he's trying to point out in a way. Yeah. Even though yeah. if he realizes that she killed, she tried to kill him, that, you know, that's, that's murder. I mean, <laughs> right. yeah, she's insane. Get much, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You don't get much crazier than that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, so you kind of think like, well, maybe he did genuinely like Jane. I don't know that you ever really know. Yeah, he's good at keeping uh, everything. Like he's v- he's very believable with everybody, but he keeps everything hidden. Yeah, I mean, I could see him not really caring for her and just wanting to get the scoop on Nora. Or maybe he really did care for her and that would have been gravy. Yeah, he probably convinced himself that he did because he he would go through with it probably, right? Yeah. (laughs) With with the wedding and stuff. Well, And Columbo interrupts these two at the park. And this is kind of a funny moment where he's, you know, calling them both out on their little... multiple white lies Mm -hmm. because you know jerry parks had blown off colombo like oh i really got to get some writing done and then immediately turned around and went to meet up with nora and then colombo's like and nora i didn't know that you particularly liked jerry (laughs) (laughs) he's trying hard here but he doesn't succeed yeah it's a good moment. And then Nora, Nora's clever. She's sharp. She's like, oh, you just don't know us Hollywood types. You know? <laughs> yeah. And they like kiss each other and hug. <laughs> <laughs> it's yeah. pretty good. It's pretty good. I like that. I like this whole moment here. They both, I think as, as performers, they really understand their characters. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, I imagine an actor playing an actor. They have a lot of insights into what's that, what that's like. Mm-hmm. She kisses him on the cheek. Yeah. And you got to wonder like how true that is, you know, like this idea that you say horrible things about each other and then you see each other at an event and you're just super nice and friendly and I'm sh- not a big deal. Yeah. It's I'm sure it's quite common. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. Even the murder thing and the abuse thing. <laughs> yeah. Obviously it's quite yeah. common. The abuse yes. thing. Yeah. All right, Paul, well, it's time to go make a movie again. Let's do it. Let's do it. Okay, so Nora's back on the studio. She's filming again. She's back in her navy blue sweater dress. That, that's with the with star. The, I love that. Star. Yeah, little sea star. So cute. And Columbo shows up on the set, and he starts laying out all these little clues to Nora. Well, it's great how he, like, interrupts the shot mm-hmm. and makes it, he, like, hit moves the ladder. And <laughs> and the guy who gives her her booze who or, or whatever is in there, was it booze? Or not booze. Yes. Yeah. It was booze. Yeah, it okay. Was. And mm-hmm. then he he's also the one who said, So and so, Jerry's at your house. That's um that's a famous actor. That's John Archer, uh, who plays Paul, her assistant. Okay. Yeah, he was in I watched a movie called White Heat with James Cagney, and he plays oh, wow. one of the main detectives going after James Cagney. It's a Warner Brothers film. It was like a Warner Brothers film that James Cagney didn't want to do anything with them. Uh, he had always played these kind of like tough heavies gangster type, but in, in white heat, he really, uh, it's, he's great. Jimmy, James Cagney, John Archer is really good too. The, that cast is really nice. Um, but James Cagney is the one he's like on top of the world. Ma, I don't know if you've ever seen a clip of that. He's this bad guy, but it, it's, it's, he's great. He does like all these scenes, like he's real close to his mom. Who's also a criminal, and anyway, John Archer was, uh, you know, one of the main uh, actors in that film. And that, that was, that's one of Warner Brothers' best films. That a lot of people, Richard Schinkel, the wonderful uh, time critic, um, he wrote a book about James Cagney, but uh, Scorsese, Peter Bogdanovich, rest in peace. Uh, um, you know, he, Peter Bogdanovich has probably seen as many films as Scorsese. 
but they are a lot of those guys are on uh, these reissues of these movies talking about the films and Cagney's performance. And so, but this is another one of those actors who um, they wanted to fill out this film with a lot of big actors. They didn't get a lot of them, but I think John Archer is one of the uh, well-known actors from the past that they wanted in the film. Yeah. It's such a small role, but he did a good job. Yeah. Very different. If you see him in white heat, you'll see he plays he's super handsome guy with, he had all his hair then. And, and he's like, we're going to get him. We're going to, we're going to corner him. He's coming down La Cienega. And there's a lot of map stuff in white heat all over LA. Okay. Um, mm-hmm. Very entertaining film. White heat. Okay. We should put a link to that one too, just in case people are curious. Yeah. That's yeah. James Cagney. He's kind of, he's kind of, I think it's Kubrick compared him to Kubrick compared him to Nicholson uh, with to Spielberg one time. He was Spielberg and Kubrick were talking and, Spielberg said this and um, talking about casting people and Kubrick's like, well, do you like James Cagney? Cause James Cagney is kind of, it's different. I don't know. Like Nicholson, you know, kind of himself plays himself sort of, you know, he doesn't do like a, like Robert De Niro sort of changing his look much or ever changing his accent. Like maybe I think he did in some early films, but sorry, I don't know why I was talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> It's all good. It's all but yeah, good. John Archer as Paul. I, I like watching him. What do you think about Frank Converse? John- who plays the uh, the head of the studio, Mr. Fallon. Oh, he was good. Yeah. He was really convincing. So this scene, you know, Columbo's laying out the clues. It makes Nora perspire and she needs a drink. And then Mr. Fallon shows up. Who Who is the actor again, Paul? Who did you just say? Frank Converse. Frank Converse, yeah. And he's wearing, um, he looks really cool he's wearing like burgundy slacks and a matching burgundy turtleneck and then like a purple sport coat he looks uh he looks really stylish and this is where colombo learns about i believe this is the moment where colombo learns that um nora refuses to give up her bungalow even the back lot yeah she won't give up so now Columbo gets called he's he's wandering around the studio a bit he checks out the props department and then he gets called to Edith Head's office yay yay so there's a great um little cameo by Edith Head who was the um Academy Award winning um costume designer she won eight Academy Awards wow it's amazing she was nominated for like 35, I want to say. And in this scene, she actually has seven of, of her. She has, she's only won seven when this was filmed. Oh, okay. And all, all seven are on her desk, which I think is kind of hilarious. Like, I don't know I think they, how common yeah, that is. I, I read somewhere that she did keep them in there, but I don't know if she kept them like that. Um, yeah. That, that looks like it's set up for the, the uh, camera, but who knows? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it seems like something that would be for the show because that would be kind of awkward to have your awards right on your desk. Like yeah, that. but I think they were in her they were in her office though. Yeah, I mean, I would keep them in my office if I had some. Yeah, she was good friends <laughs> with Ann Baxter. Yeah, I did. I saw that she she yeah. when Ann Baxter, I told you she went to Australia mm-hmm. uh, to this area. It's spelled G I R O. So I don't know if that's Hero Jero or what. Um, yeah, but she got married there when she got married there, Edith made her dress and I think her daughters oh. and she, she actually reads a little bit of one of Edith's letters that Edith wrote to her while she was in Australia. Cause she was in Australia for several years, um, or a few years. Yeah. I'll show you. It's funny. This is the, uh. The book. Oh, you got the book. Yeah, they have it at the library. Information. Oh, well, that's awesome. They had it at the uh, Burbank uh, Central Library. And then these two are... Paul just showed, for the podcast listener, Paul just showed, Paul just showed us um, Intermission, uh, a, a memoir by Ann Baxter. Yeah. And then yeah. our our good friend, Katie Custer... Uh, rest in peace. She was a makeup artist, but she, her, her family gave us these books um, that were hers. So this is, Oh, cool. This one's great. 
if he Edith Edith Heads Hollywood. Yeah, if you want to know more about Edith Head, this was a journalist who interviewed her. Um, but he got by Edith Head and Patty. Edith Head and Patty who? Um, uh, Patty Callistro. Okay. And Betty Davis does the intro. Oh wow! Yeah, and um, he got all of these. Uh, she was writing her autobiography, but she passed before she was able to complete it. So he was able to get access to all of her interviews that she re- had recorded. And then here's another one that Katie, Katie's uh, sister and parents uh, let us have. Okay. This book just says Edith head. Is it yeah. just photos of her costumes? No. Um, it, she, so she did sketches, right? So a lot of the oh, okay, yeah. costume people did sketches. And so, she learned to sketch when she got hired because she didn't, she lied and said she knew how to sketch. And so she even borrowed some students from one of the universities where she was learning to sketch. She took their sketches and pretended like they were hers. Oh, wow. Yeah. So <laughs> show and tell here. Yeah. Okay. Another picture of Edith head coming up here on the screen. This was like a commemorative thing. Uh, Isabella Alston and Catherine Dixon made this book. The other one is they had to have read this one to get the information. This one, I believe. So, all right. So we'll put those three different books that Paul just showed me on our Instagram and it will put a link in the show notes so that you can see the different books. If you want to learn more about Ann Baxter or Edith head. So I'm just going to make a little note here. And those books. You should look at the IMDB picture that they use for Edith head. Mm-hmm. While for the X-ray images they show while you're watching Columbo, uh, she's just really stunning, and she doesn't have her glasses. She always, um, I think, they they talk about her why she wore the glasses. Uh, she didn't like to be photographed in the beginning, but if you look on the X-ray IMDb TV, the X-ray the photo they show, it's a really young photo of her. Yeah, I see that. Yeah, isn't that great cool. looking? Yeah, so cool. She has 433 credits as a costume designer. Wow. Looks like her last credit was 1982. And then she has many, many cameos. I don't quite know how IMDb divides up um, an acting credit and a cameo credit, but she has several. She was in like over 20, over 30 movies as sort of a cameo. So... Well, Hitchcock did that, and she was in, and she did all of Hitchcock's films. Okay, yeah. Maybe she kind of took the. Uh, I, she worked so hard. Yeah, I bet she loved what she did, obviously. But she worked would work like sixteen hour, eighteen hour days. Wow. Um, and she, her, uh, the guy who was the head of costume at Paramount, was her mentor. I unfortunately, forget his name. He taught her so much and she loved working with him. He was a real bad alcoholic. He would go on these binges and she would cover for him um, all the time. And eventually they let him go, but they made it sound like he left on his own. And then people called her out saying that she wanted his job. Oh, geez. But then everybody came to her defense saying, not true, not true at all. Okay. All right. Well, that was a cool little cameo. And in this scene, Nora sort of, uh, spills spills her guts um, to Columbo and says, you know what, I've been lying to you. Jerry Parks does have dirt on me. And she tells this to him like while she's putting a neck a, a tie around his neck. It's a, it's a cool little moment there. And Columbo gets a new tie from her, which he, uh, he does not wear for long. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he's like, I have an anniversary coming up. Can I just... Uh, could I have my tie back? <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a good moment. All right, well, it's time to look at um, Jerry's files, Paul. we got to yeah. see what Jerry has. So Nora has told Columbo he's got some dirt on me. You've got to get it out of him. And so Columbo goes to Jerry's house with a search warrant to look through his files. Um, Nora's changed clothes again. This must be outfit number eight. Outfit number eight for Nora. And she's wearing a a very serious plaid suit with the navy blouse. And she's using this moment because she wants Columbo to think that she does not have a motive for killing Jerry Parks. Because the dirt that Jerry has on her has already been shared with 
the with Mr. Simmons, um, the man that she essentially swindled. And then Jerry says, well, I have my suspicions about other stuff, but he, Columbo can't get him to say anything more. He's like, it's just, it's just suspicions, nothing, no evidence. So how did this change? Like, how did, why did she decide to, is it because she felt it would make Jerry look bad? So did she share this with uh, the new owner of studio? Kevin yeah, McCarthy? so she befriended um, the new owner of the studio, Mr. Simmons. Um, you know, she sort of showed a romantic interest in him. Who knows if it was genuine or not. So maybe she took a chance because it, maybe it could have gone the other way, huh? But he, she told him. She told Mr. Simmons. That's what I'm saying. Like, she took a chance telling him. Oh, yes. Don't you think, right? Yes. Like, it could have gone... So that, so that was the new development. And then she's like, great, now I can show that I already yes. told somebody. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. And he kind of defends her. She probably had Mr. Simmons sort of under her thumb by the time she told him. Yeah. You know, because he's pretty enamored of her. Yeah, yeah, um, that's true. So she probably felt pretty secure that she could tell him and he would not, you know, flip his lid. But who knows? Yeah, I mean, it still was a risk. All right, so it's time to go back to Nora's bungalow for another outfit change, Paul. <laughs> this time, I think you should do that for the next podcast. Like, just, like whenever you take a break, mm-hmm. just change your outfit. <laughs> See, I changed mine. <laughs> yes, so I got that's true. A sweater on now. I know. I could. I, ha- I have several sweaters I could change. Okay, you could wear a hat and a scarf. <laughs> 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 I could have several hats here. Different Good glasses. Well, these are my only glasses, so. But yeah, I could definitely change my hat. I could do do my glasses. (laughs) So now now I'm in the... Paul has put on a pair of glasses, everyone. (laughs) Listen to your listener. All right, so back at at Nora's bungalow, she is putting on a hot pink sleeveless turtleneck with a navy suit that's lined with some hot pink fabric. It's pretty, pretty cool. And a big golden chain belt. Now, this outfit looks awesome on her, but it's definitely, you know, dated. It's definitely a more of a 70s, we'll, we'll live in the 70s only kind of a look. But it's super fun. It's super fun. So Columbo's gone back to the bungalow to talk to Nora. He um, tries to get um, his wife on the phone so that maybe his wife can talk to Nora. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then his brother or his brother-in-law tells him that um nora chandler's on tv they're they're airing one of her movies so he turns on her tv and in this we in this moment we see something click for columbo um something dawns on him because he's watching nora play a murderer or or not, not we don't actually know if she's a murderer but nora is playing a character on tv that is you know sneaking around doing something and she's dressed as her husband What's funny is they show that the teaser, they show this scene, but it's in color. Oh, really? Yeah, at the very beginning of Columbo. Oh, okay. I didn't notice that. Yeah, because it's black and white in this moment. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and apparently they filmed this scene just for the, the movie. It wasn't like old footage of, Nora, of uh, Ann Baxter's or anything. And so Columbo wants to update Nora on what he's learning so far. So he walks her from her bungalow to a press reception across the studio and there's this, so they're, they're kind of walking through the studio, through the, through the lot, and they pass a parking spot. This is like so random that I noticed that this, but there is a little parking spot marker that says um, Stan Callis, like reserved for Stan Callis. And so it's really clear. It's just quick, but it's really clear and easy to read. And so I had to look up like, who is that? And apparently he was a producer at Universal, and he actually produced several of the later Columbos. Oh, wow. Yeah, the Colum- like the second generation Columbos or whatever, the reboot. Yeah, that's so cool. You caught that. That's when he, when he pulls up to her house? So he, he's walking her, the two of them are walking oh. together across the studio. Right, right. Towards another building. And you just see it in the background. Wow, good catch. Yeah. And I was like, oh, okay, so this is a real person. That's not like a prop. And he was probably there producing um, Jigsaw, 
based on the timeline of like all the shows he produced and what was the show that was a universal show. And Jigsaw, I don't know if you've heard of this show. But Is it produced, a TV show? It's a TV show produced by Universal, produced by Stanley Callis. And here's a summary from IMDb. Lieutenant Frank Dane worked for the California State Police as a dogged investigator of missing persons cases. No one was better at piecing together clues and solving mysteries as Dane's cases took him all over the Golden State. He was also, so Stanley Callis was also a producer on Hawaii Five O, which I think oh, okay. might have been a universal production, but that was filmed in Hawaii. So he probably wouldn't need a parking spot. At Universal. <laughs> yeah, how do you spell Callis? K A L L I S. So he produced a ton of stuff. Okay, yeah, police story. Mm-hmm. Okay. Anyhow, it's just a fun little tidbit I saw there. It was exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. I love that. <laughs> also, what's Jigsaw was a movie and a TV show. Oh, okay. Yeah, I saw his name connected to the TV show. Oh, okay. Yeah, interesting. Yeah. It was, it was, uh, well, he, it did was both. he did oh, both. He did both. Okay. All right. Yeah. Well, it was in production at the same time that this show was probably in production. Yeah. Because this aired in 71, so it's probably filming and they're probably filming it in 70. Yeah, they were both at 72. So it's probably, that was probably like the pilot, maybe, or something, you know? Yeah. Cool. All right. So, um, so Columbo lays out some more clues to Nora and then. In the next scene, Nora is sitting in a fake car back on her movie shoot or set, I should say. And I guess this is called a rear projection cutaway car. So you can project a street, you know, moving street images behind the car. And it looks like the person's actually driving on the road. But it's kind of cool because she's she's in this car and then it transitions to Nora in a real car, and she tries to run over Jerry Parks again outside the bookstore. And I, I kind of like the way that they piece that the story together there. It's like the beginning a little bit. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you totally. Think, you think you're watching a real murder. Yes. And that movie FX, did you ever see that with Brian Dennehy? No. Uh-uh. And the Australian actor. It was really good. It, it, it opens up that way. You think you're watching... Like this is the movie, but you're not. It's it's a set. Okay. But it, the way that when that came out, and probably when this came out, you everybody's like, "Oh, what's going on?" And you're like, "Oh, it's a movie." Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that director Sid Miller, who plays Sid, yeah, that he was a real director. He directed Get Smart, uh, That Girl, The Adams Family, My Mother, The Car, My Favorite Martian, Peter Loves Mary. Just a ton of stuff. So he was a real director playing himself, Sid, Sidney Miller. Yeah, very cool. Well, Columbo shows up to the, so we're almost, we're almost at the end here. Columbo's hot on her trail and he shows up to the scene of Jerry Parks's, you know, attempted rundown and he starts yelling about finding a Shriner. And then he comes back to the set where Nora is again behind the car. She's in her final outfit of the show. It's like this really cool brown dress. It looks kind of like a bandana print. <laughs> yeah, it's it's cool. She looks awesome in it. Um, anyhow, so he shows up to the studio. He, he interrupts the set. He's like, this is an emergency, emergency. And he has an envelope. He shows it to Nora. It has her initials in it. And it has a Shriner's ring inside. And this just pushes Nora over the edge she tells the director, I feel horrible, I need to go. And she runs home to her bungalow where Columbo is waiting for her. She actually runs through the bungalow straight to the backyard, to, to the fountain. And uh, Columbo turns on the light behind her and she's startled. And uh, Columbo's like, oh, I really, I hoped it, you know, I wished it wasn't true. But mm-hmm. I know that you killed Jean. I know that you put that fountain there when, you know, the day after your husband went missing. Um, and I know the reason that you don't want to sell off. You do, I know the reason you don't want the, to lay piping is because they'd have to dig underneath it. And Jean, you know, he's, so he's clearly put it together and she, Nora just confesses. She's like, yep. <laughs> but, you know, she tells us the sad story about her husband 
you know, he's was cheating on her and he had brought someone home to their bungalow and they got in a big fight and she hit him. So it wasn't, you know, necessarily intentional, but she panicked. And she continued to do and another she, murder. Yes. And yes. Then a third one. Almost a third. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Oh, and, um, Columbo takes a drink with her. You know, he occasionally he will take a drink, but it's not that common that mm-hmm. he actually takes a drink with somebody. Sometimes he, he'll like accept the drink, but never actually drink the drink. But in this scene, he actually drinks a drink with her. And that's, that's it. And then he, she's like, okay, let's go downtown. And that's the end. Yeah. Do you have any thoughts on that last scene there, Paul? Anything stand out to you? Uh, I liked, yeah, that she confessed in the way that she did. And yeah, I thought it was good. Yeah, she's a, she's a super talented, she was super talented yeah. artist. Yeah, for sure. She was really convincing. She sh- she was so expressive with her, with her face this whole episode, you know, just looking surprised. And, you know, she doesn't have any kind of poker face. She's like really shows her emotions. I watched a number of her performances and she worked with so many good directors Alfred Hitchcock, uh, Orson Welles. She was in The Magnificent Ambersons. I w- always wanted to see that, and I finally watched it because of her. And um, and that's a that that was a really good movie. You could see, you know, what they the studio changed, what you know upset Orson Welles, but it's still very good. It's still worth absolutely watching. Some people think that one's better than Citizen Kane. Oh wow, okay. Um, but she's in it, and I watched a really cool one called Swamp Water. It was one of her first films, and it was Jean Renoir's first film, uh, the famous French. It was his first um, American film. They, they uh, shot the exteriors in Georgia. Uh, these got these beautiful shots of the swamp waters, and she plays like this sort of. She's really young in it, um, but she's a little bit country wild. What else did I say? Oh, Henry's. Oh, Henry's house. Oh, Henry's full house. The writer. Oh, Henry. Uh, he was kind of like uh, uh, John Steinbeck hosts the movie. He talks throughout the movie. Um, yeah, it's these little short stories. Uh, oh, Henry was a real big writer, um, wrote about stuff in the 1900s and kind of like Mark Twain. There's this irony at the end of each story. Um, she was in that, one of the one of the stories in it. And what else did I see? Uh, Homecoming with her first husband, John Hodiak. Uh, with Clark Gable and Lana Turner. She, oh, really good one was called um, Walk on the Wild Side. Uh, John Fonte, the really great writer uh, that inf- influenced Bukowski and became friends with him. He was one of the writers on that. And the, the film this is this black and white film with Jane Fonda and Baxter plays uh, a Hispanic woman uh, who owns a restaurant. Um, but she always kind of changed. She always tried to do something different with her roles so it's like seeing her as this character, she's doing it like as if she were this ego kind of person. She's very different in her other roles and performances. And of course she's, you know, she's older in this one compared to a lot of the ones that I saw, but in walk on the wild side, Barbara Stanwyck is in that who was a really good actress and the Hollywood reporter used to do this thing where they, if a, if a journalist was out, they would have, a rambling reporter, which would be a actor. They might write something for the Hollywood reporter. And Barbara Stanwyck did that one time. And um, she talked about her favorite films and favorite performances. And one of her favorite performances was Ann Baxter as this in um, uh, the razor's edge, which was remade with Bill Murray, but it's fa- ba- based on the book, but her scene, this drunk scene that Barbara Stanwyck likes so much. Ann Baxter plays this, She's in Paris and she's drunk just on the, the verge of tears. And she won an Oscar for that, that film. And, and that scene, she's really good. She's really, it's bubbling up just, and there's another scene where she's even drunker and um, she's great. Like her, some of her moves are just like, Oh yeah, she looks really drunk. Um, so she, yeah, she was a very, and her dad was her grand, her grandfather was a uh, famous architect, Frank Lloyd. Wright. Oh, Wow. And they were very close. He built a theater for her when she was young. Oh my gosh. That's pretty awesome. Yeah. In the beginning of her book, Intermission, she talks about him 
And then all of a sudden he suddenly dies and the funeral and her having to go to, I forget where he had one of his most famous places that he lived. And she said she just going there now that he's passed was so hard for her. She didn't like, didn't have the same feeling. Yeah. Frank Lloyd Wright was her. Wow. Very artistic family. So, so yeah, I could see how she really applies herself. And when she talks about, she talked about it in intermission too. Um, because when she got married the second time and moved to Australia, she didn't act, but her husband didn't express himself emotionally. Like he would bury that instead of arguing or honoring the, the feeling that you get, you know, a lot of people, you know, say you shouldn't express yourself certain ways. And it's hard because you don't want to offend people. You don't want to kill the messenger. And some people look up to people who do that. You know, it's all different ways. And I've always had a hard time expressing myself. And so for her, when she was in the outback and she didn't want to fight with her husband, but she did not not want to, she wanted to honor her feelings. And she wasn't, she wasn't addicted to argument or anything like that. It was just, he was the opposite. And because she didn't have any acting to do, that's where she always got it out. She said she was like, used her emotions all the time in acting and was good for her and cathartic. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of interesting to think about. I could see that. Yeah. How acting would let you get your feelings out on a regular basis in a very safe, safe way. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Yeah. The safe way. Yeah. Cause yeah, that's very, um, emotions are really powerful. Yeah. Not everyone's used to having them expressed. Mm-hmm. All right, Paul, well, we better wrap this up. Let's do it. Okay. So in our wrap up, we always give a rating from one to 10 for each episode. And Paul, do you have a, a rating for this one? I do. I thought about it uh, this afternoon. I would say like out of 185. Yeah. I think there was so much, there's so many um, interesting lines and scenes. Uh, it was just full of rich stuff throughout. And I, it's like, I could watch it again for sure, because I want to see how she kind of kept it. I, there wasn't as much as the stuff that I love of, of Columbo hounding her and trying to outwit. I mean, there was, right? But she always played it the same. Like, look, you got to believe me, you know, like, blah, blah, blah. So I like when there's a when there's fencing. And with her, there was less of that. But uh, between, you know, Edith Head and then even uh, the actor I mentioned who was in White Heat, just a couple scenes, Jane Archer, yeah. But there's a lot of humor, you know, throughout and a uh, really good opening. yeah. I really enjoyed this one. I mean, the costumes and the music was, as we said, the one from Greenhouse Jungle. Yeah. And I don't know if we mentioned it, but in Koenig's book, is that, that's how you say yeah. it? Yeah, Koenig. Mm-hmm. Koenig, yeah, sorry, Koenig. David, he mentions that, I think it was um, Paul Glass had composed the music for Greenhouse Jungle and it was sort of, he was in a sort of experimental mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. guy. And so they they couldn't use that. They didn't use it. And so that's why you have, I mean, I think they, he mentions they would repeat using a lot of the same music here and there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but this one uses heavily, I think, from Greenhouse Jungle. Yes, yeah. So what did you think? Yeah, I like this one a lot. I liked, um, I loved Anne Baxter's performance. I thought she did a really great job. I liked that it was set, I mean, on a movie studio. I also, there were some things I wish it was more, I, I like. also like being out and about and seeing more of, you know, Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was fun to see the behind the scenes part of being on a movie studio and, you know, how the sets kind of come together. Yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. And I liked some of the sets, the scenes outside the studio were really great. Like Jerry Parks' home, the Sportsman's Lodge, La Dolce Vita, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, And it was the way Columbo pieced this one together, I thought was really clever. And of course, the outfits. I love all the outfits. The things I, I missed, you know, I wish um, there were more parties and food because, you know, I like all that stuff. <laughs> I also, I, I miss that sort of back and forth when Columbo really knows who it is and, and gets to really, um, you know, follow them around and hound them in a sense. Yeah. But it wasn't as much of that. And then, um, you know, so much of it was filmed on a studio. So you kind of, you get some of that s- studio feel, like yeah. a little too much studio feel. Yeah, I would say this is really strong. I, I think I would also give it an eight and a half 
out of 10. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. 8.5. 8.5. Mm-hmm. Awesome. It was a good title too. I liked Requiem for a Falling Star. Yeah, Jackson Gillis. Yeah, there was there was good turns and and uh, Mel Ferrer was great to Oh yeah, he was really good. He's a very interesting dude. Yeah. He did a great job for sure. All right, Paul, do you have any trivia questions for me? Yeah. As part of our wrap up here? Yes, I do. Okay, let's hear them. Okay. Um, Edith Head went to school at the University of Alabama. Hmm. Paul, I don't know about this. I'm going to say that's false. Are you sure? Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's false. Yes. Yeah, she went to Stanford. She did. Yeah. All right, Edith. Yeah, she went to Stanford, Otis, and then um, University of California at um, Berkeley. Oh, she went from Stanford to Berkeley? That's kind of wild. Big rivals, you know. Berkeley to Stanford, I think. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, and then she went to Otis and then somewhere other place to do the drawing. Okay. Famous Sh- Chouinard or Chouinard? Mm-hmm. Number two. I got one one out of one so far. I'm on a roll. I had a date at, at the sports lounge. Oh, Paul. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to say that's true. No. Oh. No, it's true. It's oh, it true. is? Yeah. Yes. It wasn't a date date. It was a uh, sag after thing. Uh-huh. And it, yeah, it was so weird. It was like a sag after meeting for um, uh, questions about new media. So like Netflix and stuff like that when it was first coming out. Okay. Because it was changing the rules on, on how you get... Uh, oh, yeah, your SAG card? Well, no, no, royalties from oh, royalties. repeated viewings on cable. And because it's not cable, because they didn't have uh, contracts, people wouldn't get any of that stuff. Um, and so it's sort of it's sort of changed, different contracts that have come about. But it was funny because I went there at night. I had never heard of it, Sports Lounge. Mm-hmm. And I, I was That's walking kind of on the on the pier thing that they yeah. walked oh, on, on that little bridge. And I had to go to the back and I'm like, what is this place? Yeah. <laughs> it was so weird. I was like, is this a hotel? Yeah. And that the office, I was looking at the pictures that they said the office shot that scene. Uh-huh. That's the kind of back room we were in. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. like that. It may have been the same place. Yeah. Um, probably, probably. So. Oh, that's cool, Paul. Yeah. Yeah. I'm two for two tonight. Yeah. Very this is good. what this is what happens when we have a, a non alcoholic beverage. I have a I have a better shot at getting to right. you, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Probably should have a drink next time, then, Liz. <laughs> Just, okay, what's number three? Uh, okay, so what you got? What you got, Paul? Uh, Barney's Beanery was where all the artists used to hang out at. What artists? Like Dean Stockwell. Like if anybody was an artist, like painters actors you would hang out at barney's beanery mm, i'm gonna say that's not true it is true what yep. where did you hear that dean stockwell dean stockwell said that yep he said all the actually go there eve babbitts there's a book that was just just she just recently passed um she ran in those circles with very famous painters um she was in the photograph her and marcel duchamp is that it? no God, i'm getting the names wrong there's Man Ray, Marcel Duchamp. Yeah, it's it's her. She's nude and she's playing chess. It was a photograph taken at in Pasadena Art Museum, not the Norton Simon. I think it was before it was called Norton Simon. But it was it was another location location. Let's see what comes up. Um yeah, yeah. Marcel Duchamp played chess with the naked Eve Babbitts. It's a f- famous photograph. Um okay. so Eve Babbitts talks about Barney's Beanery in her book too about all oh the artists gosh. going there. Okay, um, and you'd recognize a lot of the names. So uh, it's kind of funny because you wouldn't you wouldn't know that going to the one that's the, still yeah. there now. It just but, looks like a diner kind of place. Yeah. So tight. Yeah. It's like if you think about the you know coffee shops back in the day. You know that's where a lot of people would go. Yeah. You know. So it's similar. You know, times just change. Mm-hmm. What you're doing it for, why you're doing it what you want to do but like Dennis Hopper I think you know he was there with Dean Stockwell and them wow so you got Very one wrong cool. Liz <laughs> I did 
But two out of three is pretty good for me, Paul. I know. No, you always do really good. No, I don't always. Yeah, usually. No, I think I usually get some wrong. Okay. Well, time to wrap this up. Um, Thank you to Maxime Gervais for our theme song, Columbo. Thank you, Maxime. And this podcast is edited by John Warenas. Yay, John. Thank Thank you, you, John. And if you'd like to add to our conversation, please email us at trenchcoatcigar at gmail.com or find us on Instagram. We're at trenchcoatcigar. Um, And if you could give our podcast a rating and a review wherever you listen, that really helps our show by helping more listeners find us. (laughs) So please take a moment if you don't mind. Hey, Paul, one more thing. What, Liz? Thanks for listening. (laughs) Yay. Yay. We did did it. it.